The ACCA Advanced Financial Management Syllabus is huge. Um, so in this section onwards, I'll be taking you through to revise the syllabus in very simple words. Now firstly, there are four key areas that you must know so you can pass the AFM syllabus very easily. Firstly, you need to know there will be three decisions that we need to make in financial management including the investment decision, which means spend the money out in buying the asset, the financing decision, which means where does the money come from and the cost of finance, and also how we're going to be distributing the profit back to our investors, which means the dividend policy decisions. And of course, you may be aware that an increase in investment decision will certainly require more finance available to the business, and of course, if we get more finance, alternatively, we will increase the dividend paid to our investors. It's very, also very important that you understand that three decisions are interlinked with each other. And if a business does a good job, of course, in terms of the business valuations point of view, that the business value will be a lot higher. And of course, in the AFM syllabus, when we talked about the business valuation in particular, we are talking about the value of equity, how we're going to be determining that value of equity using the free cash flows to equity methodology, the value of debt, so for example, the valuation of traded debt in particular. What if, if there are any changes in risks when we are valuing the business, so how we're going to deal with it, especially when the business enters into a new industry, and of course, we need to determine the payment form. And in the AFM syllabus, for example, the payment form can be in the form of cash, in the form of convertible bond, and in the form of share for share exchange. So which means we are exchanging your shares with my shares and involving no cash being spent by the acquirer. And of course, we will need to calculate the percentage of gains or losses as a result from each of the payment method in the exam. Of course, if the business is not doing a good job, we will need to think about finally the reconstruction and reorganization of the business. So the simple term, the reconstruction and reorganization, simply means that we're going to be saving the business which means reconstructing the business, so for example, using the debt for equity swap. Alternatively, to reorganize the business to improve it further. So for example, by following the corporate governance, laws and regulations, that kind of stuff. And once we've covered the first part of the syllabus area, the majority part of the syllabus will be to focus on the basis of the investment decision. So here, we are particularly talking about the net present value analysis or the NPV analysis based on the future cash. Of course, in order to perform the NPV analysis, we need three factors. For example, the number of years into the future and the relevant cash flows. And here, I will interpret this as the free cash flows to firm or the free cash flow methodology and we'll talk about that later on. And finally, we need the appropriate discount factor, or we need a rate, so we can calculate that appropriate discount factor later on. So we talk about the investment decisions, we are predicting what will be going on at some point in the future, and this is why when talking about the number of years, so as time goes by in the future, there might be a change in the foreign exchange rate risk. There might be a change in the interest rate. So this means that there might be a risk about the forex changes. There might be a risk or chance that the interest rate will change. So if I were to receive or pay money in foreign currency, I would suffer from the forex risk. If I were to borrow or to deposit money at some point in the future, we will be suffering from the interest rate risk. 
And how we're going to be managing the forex as well as the interest rate risk, we will be using, for example, the internal method. For example, for the forex, we will receive the foreign currency, say no, we'll only settle that in home currency. For the interest rate, on the other hand, using the internal method, for example, we, we will be keeping a balance between the floating rate debt and the fixed rate debt altogether. Alternatively, from the exam's point of view, we will be heavily examining the external technique, so for example, entering into the financial instrument contract. So for example, for the Forex, we may be entering into the money market hedge or the currency futures or swaps. Alternatively, for the interest rate risk, we will be entering into the forward rate agreement and something like that. And in particular, we are talking about the free cash flow methodology. And from the exam's point of view, from my perspective, I would like to personally divide this into three particular areas. Firstly, I would say this will be a mixed area of the cash flow methodology to be applied in this paper. So for example, we'll be looking at things like the payback period. So for example, uh, how many years that we can recover our initial investment. Alternatively, we will be considering the time value of money effect, which means the discounted payback period. And of course, we may be considering the risks involved as well. And this is why we need to calculate something called duration. Because one of the disadvantages of using payback or discounted payback alone is that the payback or discounted payback only tells you when your initial investment actually pays back at some point in the future. It does not really consider the cash flows beyond the payback point. And this is why we need to look at the project's cash flows in total by considering how soon that we can get the 50% of the total present value uh, of the, from the project. And this is why we need to look at the duration later on. And after that, we will need to look at something called the internal rate of return, as well as the modified internal rate of return as the relative measure. It will be relatively simple for non-financial managers to understand. And also, we also need to look at something called the value at risk or we can call it as the VAR. So this means that given the level of confidence level, how much value that we may lose over this period, and this is what I mean by the value at risk. And of course, finally, we'll be looking at using the black source option pricing model to calculate the real option value to this particular project. So not only we look at the MPV of this project, but also we need to consider the subsequent opportunity so we can expand the project or we can get rid of a project at some point in the future. And that brings us value as well. So how are we going to be calculating this? Of course, we will be using the BSOP model and of course, from the exam's point of view nowadays, that the examiner has simplified the BSOP model. You don't really have to remember that formula. You don't really have to check the formula because you can insert the variable in the spreadsheet function. I will tell you, I'll show you how in a second. The second category of the free cash flow methodology will be combining this with the adjusted present value or the APV analysis. Because one of the disadvantages of using the traditional MPV is that we simply mix all those operating and financing cash flows all together and then to discount all of them using the weighted average cost of capital. And to me, yes, it's okay, but it's not so accurate. And this is why we we'll like to separate these two cash flows out and for the cash flows related to operation, we only discount it using the cost of equity without considering debt, which means the cost of equity ungeared. Alternatively, if cash flows related to the financing part, we will be discounting them at the risk-free rate in most circumstances. The third category is what I mean by the international investment appraisal. Now, what do I mean by international investment appraisal? 
is where we will be investing our money overseas and to receive money in the foreign currency. And of course, we need to do the MPV calculation related to that. I will show you how in a second. Of course, all of these things we will need to consider, for example, the number of years, relevant cash flows, and the discount factor. We will need to consider the risks and uncertainty inside. Now, of course, the examiner will be very keen to ask you about to comment on additional matters to be considered. When you are performing the MPV, you always need to tell the examiner that number of years may not be okay, may not be correct, because the project may not be lasting for four years uh, as what we estimated before. Vellum and cash flows estimates are not correct because there will be risks and uncertainties built in. For example, we need to look at the sensitivity analysis so this means that uh, how much does the key variable to change so that the project MPV will become zero. Alternatively, we can also consider the probability analysis. Because instead of giving me the absolute figure or the single figure for the estimated sales revenue, why not to have different many outcomes and we consider the probabilities inside. Alternatively, yes, nowadays we use simulation done by the computer, of course that will involve lots of management time uh, and may result in potential errors. However, it will give us more confidence that given the percentage of confidence level that how much MPV from these projects that we can earn using a simulation analysis. Of course, finally, we can also talk about the risk adjusted discount rate. So in other words, if we find out that the project is quite risky, why not to increase the discount rate to incorporate additional risk so to make the overall project NPV to become lower? So that's very important though. And of course, I've mentioned about the discount factor or the discount rate will be a single rate. The discount factor will be one divided into one plus the discount rate for the power of n. So let's detail that in the third part of the syllabus from my perspective though. The third part of the syllabus, I would say that I would like to talk about the discount rate. So you can refer to this as the, for example, the weighted average cost of capital or the WAC for short. And of course, when we talk about the weighted average cost of capital or the discount rate there, I would like to focus on this. Firstly, where does your money come from? So which means that we need to look at the business finance. So for example, we can borrow some money from the bank or from others. Alternatively, we can list our company onto the stock exchange. Alternatively, we don't really have to buy the asset. We can lease the asset. We can also have the Islamic finance option as well. And after that, we will need to look at the cost of capital calculation, in particular to calculate the weighted average cost of capital. So for example, we need to calculate the cost of equity using the dividend valuation model, using the capital asset pricing model or the CAPM formula. Alternatively, we'll be using the m and per position number two. Of course, these formulae will be given by the examiner. At the same time, we will also need to calculate the cost of debt, which means because for having interest expense, we can save tax. And this is why we need to times by one minus tax rate related to the cost of debt there. And after that, we'll need to calculate the cost of preference shares. We'll simply using the dividend from the preference share as the numerator and divide this into the preference share price. And this will arrive at the cost of preference share there. We mix them all together, and of course this will give me the weighted average cost of capital in the end. Of course, very importantly, we may need to consider the capital structure. Of course, from my perspective, from the AFM exam's point of view, we always focus on the M&M per position 2 application, unlike in the previous 
examiner style in many, many years ago that the m and proposition number three may also be tested. But here, we'll only be focusing on the m and proposition two application now. And of course, after that, the final bit in the AFM syllabus from my perspective, which is very important, is that we are talking about the organizational performance Yes, we need to interpret some numbers by calculating some ratios or perhaps to predict what may be going on. So, for example, given the proposal goes ahead at some point in the future, what might be the P-E ratio look like or the potential earnings per share, you will need to tell the examiner about that. Alternatively, you may be given a lot of um, written requirements most likely six marks related to corporate governance stuff. But don't get me wrong, the corporate governance topic tested in the AFM exam will be very, very practical. You need to tailor your answer specifically to the case. And of course, the key idea behind the corporate governance is all about the agency theory. Are you to tell the examiner what might be the agency cost? For example, the payment that we need to make to the executive directors to make sure that they make decisions in the best interest of a company and something like that. And finally, very importantly, would be the economic environments that we are operating in. So, for example, we may be asked about the roles of World Bank or the IMF and this kind of stuff. So make sure that you are always ready for that. Of course, if you know about, from my perspective, these four key areas, three decisions, you know they'll be link interlinked with each other and affects the business value. You know that the investment decision based on most likely is the free cash flows. And of course, you know about the discount rate stuff and also all sorts of other written parts. Of course, you will score very high in the AFM exam. Now, let's move on. From this section onwards, I'll be firstly taking you through to the free cash flow methodology, starting with the free cash flow and then revising the mixture of areas, APV analysis and international investment appraisal. So let's get started then in very, very simple words before you apply this knowledge to the actual exam. So firstly, let's consider the free cash flow methodology. What do I mean by free cash flows? are to be the cash flows available to whom? Of course, I would say that free cash flows can be the cash flows left to the entire business, but in test book, we call this as firm, or we can call it as the free cash flow to firm, for example. Alternatively, to only shareholders. So in other words, the free cash flow to equity. In order to calculate the free cash flow, my approach will be relatively straightforward indeed. Always, I will start off with the profit before interest and tax, and times by one minus tax rate. In order to arrive at the profit before interest and tax, we need sales revenue and all other costs to be deducted from the sales revenue. So let's make up a figure, let's say $100 for the PBIT, the tax rate being 20% there. So for example, to start off, it gives us $80 there. And of course, we'll need to plus the depreciation on the property plant equipment or the non-current asset back because these are non-cash, let's say $10. Alternatively, we will need to adjust for the working capital. So for example, an increase in inventory, for example, because we need to spend money out in buying inventory let's say $10, it's a minus $10 from there. So after that, we'll also need to minus the pp e property plant equipment, because for example, uh, that we invest our additional money in buying the pp e so let's say that we invest $10 out. So if that's the case there, I would say that free cash flow to firm, or TF, becomes let's say 80 plus 10, 90, minus 10, minus 10, $70. So after that, 
In order to calculate the free cash flows to equity, we will use the free cash flows to firm and to minus because starting from a PBIT before deducting interest, and now I will need to deduct interest. At the same time, I would like to times by one minus tax rate on that to avoid double counting. Let's say that the interest expense will be $5 there. And we are told the tax rate, let's say 20%, and times by 1 minus 20%. And that being the case, we minus $4 there. At the same time, finally, we may need to consider that the business may be issuing additional debt and get money in into the business. Let's say $10. And after that, we can calculate the free cash flow to equity using 70 minus 4, that would be 66, plus 10, and that would be 76 there. So which means that the cash flows available only to equity holders will be 76. And in our exam, the free cash flows to equity sometimes is known as dividend capacity which means the ability is that you can pay your dividend to shareholders. So if that's the case then, what we need to do finally, we may be asked to calculate something called the dividend cover. Now, the, to calculate the dividend cover, cover what? Cover dividend, you will need to use the free cash flows to equity and to divide this into the dividend paid or dividend payment, for example. Now, dividing into the dividend payment, so let's say that the business this year has paid, let's say, 7.6, or we can yeah, use million or thousand, something like that, of dividends to all shareholders. Now, if that's the case, then we will have 76 divided into 7.6, and that will be 10 times the ability, so we can utilize our cash flows to pay off to our shareholders in the end. Of course, in the exam, if you're also required to calculate, let's say in the part B, to calculate the weighted average cost of capital, you will need to determine the value of equity. I would say that the free cash flow to equity, sometimes it's also known as VE. VE stands for the value of equity. So make sure that you're aware that the free cash flows to equity of $76 can also be the value of equity as well. Now, after we've recapped or revised the free cash flow methodology, congratulations, yes, you can pass this paper very easily. So later on, you can practice a few past exam questions and there'll be no problem for that whatsoever. Now, moving on then, I would say that Based on the free cash flow methodology, we would like to revise the mixture of areas. So firstly, let's look at the concept of payback period and also the dis discounted payback period. And finally, we we'll also need to look at the duration concept. So make sure that we are ready for that. And of course, firstly, we we'll would like to look at the payback as well as the discounted payback period. And the way that I perform the calculation for a payback as well as the discounted payback is I always lay out three columns, number of years of a project and the cash flows if we are talking about the payback, if we are calculating a discounted payback, of course I will need to use present values. So if you are calculating the discounted payback. And the third column, I would like to summarize all the cumulative cash flows or present values, depending on whether or not you're using payback or discounted payback. So for example, at the very start, at the start of the year or today, which means year zero, we would like to invest $100 out to set up a factory, to buy the equipment, whatever you like. At the end of the first year, you can claim $40 back. So if that's the case then, so far, that you haven't paid $60 back to your business. At the end of the second year, 
from the project's cash flows, for example, we pay back $70. So if that's the case, then we summarize 40 and 70, that would be 110. Greater than the original investments that you made, 100. You've already paid your initial investment back already. But by how much? I would say that, okay, somewhere between the year one and year two, that you paid your money back. Because at the end of the year one, you still have got $60 as the target, so you need to pay additional $6 back. But in, at the end of the second year, you pay $70 already. So what I would do is that I would take one year as a starting point, and plus the money that I haven't paid back of 60, divide it into the total money that will be coming into a business of 70 in total. So if that's the case then, I would calculate something like 1.86 years so I can pay my $100 back. Of course, the 140 and 70 there can either be, yes, the cash flows or present values. So depending on whether or not you're using payback or considering the time value of money effect, which means uh, the interest effect when you're calculating the dis discounted payback period. Of course, this would be absolutely different from the duration concept, because when looking at the payback as well as the discounted payback, you only consider, okay, I've paid my money back already. So I don't really care how much money that we're coming into the business, let's say $1 or $100, I don't really care, because using payback or discounted payback, I will need to determine when I pay my money back. Take 1.86 years to pay my money back, stop from there. So does not really consider cash flows beyond the payback point, and this is why we need to introduce something called the duration concept. Now, to calculate the duration concept, firstly, you will need to use the sum of the present values of each year times by the number of years and divide this into the sum of the present values for each year. And of course, if I were you, I would like to make three narrative points on the exam script to score the full marks when we are using this methodology. Firstly, I would say that what this means is that this will stand for the number of years to recover 50% of the project present value. So making sure that you notice that if this is discounted or the cash flows discounted at the company's cost of capital. when you are calculating a present value. The second point I'd like to tell the examiner is that this means the number of years to recover 50% of our investment or initial investment. But making sure that you tell the examiner that only if the cash flows are discounted at the project's internal rate of return. Otherwise, you will get no marks on that. And the third point I'd like to tell the examiner is that the higher the duration, the riskier, or the higher the risks that the project will have. You don't really have to say the opposite side, the lower the duration, the lower the risk that we have to, but only give one point. Avoiding repetition will be very key to your exam. Now, let me show you how do we calculate duration in Excel. Now, I'd like to start to calculate the duration in the Excel function from the ACCO. I'll firstly tell the examiner that what I'm calculating will be duration. Make sure that you tell the examiner about that. At the same time, okay, we have got a project, let's say the number of years, let's say that year one and two, with the cash flows being $10 and $20. And let's say we discount it at 10% there. In the year one, we use one divided into one plus 10%, which means 1.1. 1 .1. In 
In year two, we use the previous figure divided into 1.1, and we calculate something called the present value. So we simply take equals to this times by the cash flows, and draft this here, underline this, that's all. To calculate the duration, I need to tell the examiner that present value times by the number of years. And then div divide this into the present value, sum of the present value altogether. Firstly, I would say that taking present value times by the number of years, draw this here. Of course, the sum, this plus that. Alternatively, you can use the Excel function, sum of these two, press enter, press and values, that you've got that there, for example, equals to sum of the present values. So if that's the case then, the duration, I would say that equals to the present value, the sum of present values times by number of years, divide this into the sum of present values, and that becomes 1.64. I'll tell the examiner, okay, this is my final result, and um, please check that very carefully. So here, if 10% as the discount rate is referring to as the cost of capital, we are saying that the project would take approximately 1.64 years to recover 50% of the total present value. That's all. Make sure, yes, duration, you're ready for that. Now, let's continue with our story, which means number four. We calculate something called the internal rate of return and the modified internal rate of return, IRR and MIRR. Now, firstly, I would say that you don't really have to remember that formula nowadays or check the formula sheet for the MIRR calculation because you can use Excel directly and this will be better to be straightforward indeed. But from my perspective, for the narrative part, you will need to be required to tell the examiner, if I were you, firstly, I would like to tell the examiner that these would be relative figures. And this means that this would be simple to understand by non-financial managers. Secondly, the decision criteria is that whether or not the MIR or IRR will be greater than the company's cost of capital. And if the answer for that is yes, why not do the project? And thirdly, very importantly, or the reinvestment assumption, you can always tell the examiner about that. For example, the IRR will be reinvested using the IRR assumption. So this means that IRR effectively is the maximum cost of capital to the business. Alternatively, is the real return per year to the business by considering its time value of money effect. Alternatively, the MIRR will be having the assumption that it will be, or cash flows will be reinvested in subsequent stages at the company's cost of capital. So make sure they always tell the examiner about the reinvestment assumptions in these two calculations. Now, what I would do is that I would like to calculate the IRR as well as the MIRR. Very straightforward indeed. Let's look at another project here. For example, number of years from year zero now and year one and two. So let's say that the cash flows out that I need to spend $100 out. And at the end of year one, I can get $20 back. At the end of year two, I can get $120. So if that's the case then, I'd like to calculate something called the IRR firstly. I would like to enter into equals to IRR formula and open the brackets and selecting all these cash flows and press enter. So this means that the maximum cost to the business will be 20%. So this means that if the bank quotes me, yes, to do the project, you will need to borrow at 23% uh, 
I would say no, because uh, this will not maximize the shareholders' wealth, because this will bring negative MPV to the company from the project. Alternatively, calculating MIRR will be relatively straightforward indeed. So equals to MIRR formally, open the brackets, and then selecting all these cash flows, but make sure that you tell the examiner that we are using the cost of capital. Don't use the IRR as the reinvestment assumption. For example, in our previous case, we can see that the cost of capital will be 10% there, so we can simply enter into 10%, comma, 10%. Make sure you enter to 10% in the Excel function. Make sure they are ready for that. And press enter, and that would be 19.16%. So this means that the maximum cost of capital, this means that by modifying the reinvestment assumption, the maximum cost to the business will be 0.19 or 19.16 percent. Make sure that you are ready for that. Now, let's continue our story. Number five, we need to look at something called value at risk, or we can call it as the VAR. And the calculation will be relatively straightforward indeed. The value at risk simply equals to the standard deviation, which means that uh, there might be a possibility that our average cash flow will be $10 and the actual cash flow will be $9 or something like that. So deviating from the mean or deviating or different from the average, and we times by something called Z. So luckily, nowadays, that the examiner will give you Z directly, it can either be 99% confidence level or 95% confidence level, and you can check the Z value from the standard normal distribution table directly. So for example, 99% that the examiner will directly give you, 2.33, whereby 1.65 for 95% level. And then you will need to times by the T, and we put a square root on top of that. And of course, you can say that, and this would be T for the power 1 over 2. If I were you, is that I would say that this would be 0 0.5, put a bracket next to that. Right, so let's assume some figures in. Let's say the standard deviation of the project cash flow will be $30 there. And we times by the set value of 2.33 if we are at 99% confidence level. Of course, using the standard deviation times by Z, and that would be the total amount deviating from the average. And we times by, let's say, if it is one year, and that becomes one. Alternatively, if it is four years, and that becomes, for example, two. And we use 30 times times by 2.33 and times by 2, and that becomes 139.8 dollars there. Now, we need to tell the examiner of what does that mean. So usually, uh, that calculation would stand for two marks, relatively straightforward. I would tell the examiner that this means that over four years, that we've got 99% chance that the project value will not fall by more than $139.8. This means that there might be a 1% chance that our project value will fall by more than 139.8, which means the value at risk. So make sure that you're ready for that. Okay, hope you're happy. Now, let's move on. Now let's look at something called the real options. Okay, uh, will be very, very important area from the exam's point of view. So nowadays, the, to calculate the real option value using a black source option pricing model, we simply insert the variables and job done. Now, what do I mean by that? Let's say that the traditional 
MPV value of the project, let's say, will be $2.98 million negative. So this means that if you were to proceed with that project, you will end up with a loss-making position. And therefore, we will need to consider whether or not there will be additional options value in. Of course, we would say that the option value can either be the call option, which means the option to expand, which means carry on the project with additional investment in. Alternatively, the put option, which means the option to sell, which means we can abandon the project at some point in the future. To calculate the option value, we'll need to use the BSOP model, and we'll see that now. In order to do that, firstly, you will need to define certain variables. Firstly, you will need to tell the examiner what will be the present value of your project, and we can define this as the asset price or the PA. Let's say that the total present value, excluding any investment, will be $38.75 million. At the same time, we will need to define the cost that we need to spend in order to exercise the project or to proceed with the project, which means the cost element. Let's say $35 million that it is spent on money out in order to proceed with the project. We should tell the examiner about T, T, which means that the time before incurring costs. Now, time before that we can proceed with the $35 million to be invested will be two years. And we need to define the risk-free rate given in the question, let's say 3.5% there. And finally, the standard deviation, which means the volatility of cash flows, let's say 30% there. So what we need to do, the next step, will be to insert all these variables into the Excel spreadsheet function given by the examiner. Now, if you're required to calculate the BSOP value, you can see the BSOP calculator in the bottom. And then, you simply insert the variables. So for example, it's the PA, yeah, 38.75, PE, yes, 35. R, which means uh, the risk free rate, 3.5%. T, yes, two years. The standard deviation of S, which means the volatility of cash flows, 30%. No. You press enter, you will see the call option value, or C, standing for 9.53 there. So you simply copy that 9.53 in, so this means that to do this project, the total values that we can get will be $6.55 million in total. Just tell the examiner about this, and of course everything will be fine there. Now, let's revise the second category from the investment decision here, so let's see the APV analysis, or the adjusted present value. Relatively straightforward indeed, from my perspective. We can call it as the APV, or adjusted present value analysis. So, in the past, when we are using the MPV analysis, we're mixing all these cash flows all together, including the operating as well as the financing cash flows. However, to perform the APV calculation, we are having a clever idea on this. We are splitting cash flows into the base case MPV, and then plus or minus the present value of a financing effect. We are saying that if these are the cash flows related to the 
operating cash flows will be discounted using the cost of equity and geared, which means without considering a lot uh, the, the debt element inside. Of course, for the present value of the financing effects, we are saying that these will be related to the uh, financing cash flows. And more specifically, from the exam's point of view, we are talking about three types of financing cash flows, and this will be discounted at the risk-free rates or the yield by the business related to its debt. Three types of financing cash flows will be the issue costs. Okay, so if you're issuing debt, there might be issue costs in there. And related to interests, yeah, you need to consider the tax saving on that. And also the subsidy, especially if you're investing in overseas countries, that the government might give you the lower cost debt so you can enjoy the benefit from it. Now, firstly, in order to calculate that cost of equity, which is ungeared, what I would do usually would be to use these two ways from the current exam's point of view. Firstly, referring to the M&M &M per position number two, formerly cost of equity geared equals to the cost of equity ungeared plus cost of equity ungeared minus yield and times by the debt value times by one minus tax rate divide this into equity. Of course, this formula has been given by the examiner, so all you need to do is that the examiner may be giving you the target companies or the new industries, uh, I don't know, it's the cost of equity, including debt would be cost of equity geared, is given, and you are required to calculate the cost of equity which is ungeared by giving you all sorts of other variables as well. The second way that you can calculate the cost of equity which is ungeared would be to use the capital asset pricing model, simply be the cost of equity ungeared equals to the risk-free rate, for example, uh, the uh, yield from the government security, that kind of stuff, and plus the asset beta factor times by the yield from the market minus the risk-free rate there. Of course, to calculate the asset beta, I would say that I would like to use the D-gear exercise, the asset beta equals to the equity beta times by the equity value, divided into equity value plus debt value times by one minus tax rate on that. So make sure they are ready for that. To calculate the um, financing effect cash flows, for example, for the issue costs, we'll simply use the issue cost percentage, for example, in order to raise $100 or times by the amount, you will need to incur 1% on that. So 1% times by $100, and then we need to times by one minus tax rates because costs will save us taxes. And this is why this will be a net cost to the business. For the interest element, on the other hand, we are simply saying that what will be the interest expense and times by the tax rate directly. And finally, for the subsidy, we need two steps in there. The step number one is that, yes, we'll need to pay interest on the monies that we borrow. And this means that I would like to take the interest times by the tax rate, same as what we've seen before. As the step number two there, because traditionally, we may need to borrow at 5% from the commercial bank, but from the government, we can only borrow at 3%. I will enjoy 2% of the cost savings if I were to borrow some money from the government, for example. I would like to take that difference, which means 2% on there, and times by the money that I borrow, let's say $100, and then for that benefit, I will need to pay tax on that, and what would be a net benefit after considering taxes, which means times by 1 minus the tax rate, and this will be the financing cash flows. Using these financing cash flows for each and every year and inputting the discount rate okay, at the risk-free rate and to discount them separately. So plus or minus all together and this will give us the APV. If the APV is positive, yes, proceed with the project and will bring the positive value to the business or to maximise shareholders' wealth. Now, 
The final area in the investment appraisal I would like to recap with you for the number three is the international one, which means we are investing our money overseas. Now, let's look at the international investment appraisal. Again, or basing on the concept of free cash flows there, so from my perspective, there are two things that you need to know from the international investment appraisals point of view. Firstly, always that you need to predict the future forex rate or the foreign exchange rate using purchasing power parity theory. That's the starting point. Secondly, you need to know there will be two part cash flows. On top of that would be the cash flows from an overseas country or subsidiary, and the bottom part, and that will be denominated in our own currency. Now, firstly, using a purchasing power parity theory, you will need to understand the spot rate of your current exchange rate. So, for example, for each UK pound, that can be exchanged into $2, or we can call it as $2 stroke UK pound. And then, based on the estimated inflation in both of these countries, for example, in the UK and in the US, in the year number one, let's say, there will be estimates there will be 10% increase in prices, for example, inflation in the UK, or 15% happening in the US. In the year two, later on, 8% and 10% of the inflation in the UK and US, respectively. Now, the final step that we need to do is that, firstly, you will need to put the spot rating, let's say, to predict the future exchange rate in the year one. Firstly, you will need to take that spot rating, and then you will need to tell yourself that this will be your first currency, and this will be your second currency, which means the variable and base currency, but you don't really have to know that. First and second currency, so all you need to do is that one plus the inflation rate in the first currency, one plus the inflation rate in the second currency. Now, first currency denominated in the USD, so we take 15% there. Second currency, we are using UK pound, we are taking 10% from there. So 2 times by 1.15, uh, divide this into 1.1, and that becomes, for each UK pound, equals to 2.09 USD. So carry this forward in a year two, 2.09 USD is Joe UK pound, one plus in the first currency, AC US, which means 10% in the numerator, and in the denominator, 8% there, so that becomes the rate of 2.13 USD stroke UK pound. So this is how we predict the future exchange rate. Now, the second element is that we've got two parts cash flows there. You need to tell yourself that the first part of the cash flows, you need to tell yourself that these would be denominated in the foreign currency. So what do I mean by this is that you will see the layout of your international investment appraisal uh, MPV calculation for the future number of years. For example, in the year one and year two, we've got the sales revenue expect respectively. We've got different expenses, possibly with the royalty payments back to our parents' company. You just subtract that in the foreign currency. But very importantly is that when you calculate the tax paid, the shortcut approach would be firstly to deduct all the tax depreciation after the expenses. That's very important as a starting point there. Let's assume some figures. Assuming that we've got 100 of the sales revenue 30 of the expenses and 20 of the tax depreciation 
and then we arrive at $50 and we need to pay tax on that. So for example, we calculate the tax paid, let's say 10% of taxes payable in the current year. We simply take that 10% and times by the taxable profit worth of 50, so that becomes $5 of the tax paid. And after that, we would say the tax depreciation is non-cash element. So this is why we cannot subtract it in the MPV calculation. So all we can do is to plot this back. Plot the tax depreciation in, let's say, $20 in. And that's all we can do. So carry this on in the year two, you can see the same thing. So make sure that you're ready for that. Of course, the examiner sometimes may be interested in, okay, adding a bit of stuff in asking you, okay, what if we've got tax losses that we can carry this back and to uh, enjoy the tax benefit on that? Okay, so after the tax depreciation deducting $20, you will also need to consider the adjustment for tax losses on that. Okay, so make sure that you're ready. Of course, after we've considered the first part of the cash flows, the second part of the cash flows, you always need to tell yourself will be denominated in our own currency. So after you've calculated all these cash flows denominated in the foreign currencies, you will need to adjust for the um, predicted exchange rate into your own currency. So any sort of cash flows paid by the subsidiary company or branch overseas to the parent will need to bring this back okay, in the second part of our cash flows. Of course, paying the taxes, okay, so on top of that in our own country will be absolutely fine there. Nothing special, but to make sure that you input all these elements into the formula so you can score very high marks in this topic. Now, congratulations from my perspective so far. I've recapped on the first part regarding the free cash flow mixture APV international investment appraisal uh, topics in the AFM syllabus. Congratulations on that. So make sure, yes, AFM syllabus, huge syllabus and very difficult indeed. But of course, I can help you with that with my course on AFM. I've got experience in marketing, I've got experience in teaching the AFM in very simple words and using my own technique and own summary, I'm sure that you will benefit from my approach to ace your AFM exam in the upcoming sitting. My name is Steve Chun, the fellow member of ACCA, the course director at Global APC. I look forward to seeing you in the next of our session. Bye for now then. APC accounting for your future it's time for foreign currency risk management uh, in the ACCA AFM exam so we shorted for forex issues now in order to deal with the risk management with, the, with regards to the foreign currency it's important that firstly, you will need to understand the Forex quote. Now this is particularly important because later on, irrespective of whether or not you're using the internal or the external technique, you will need to understand which rates that you are going to be using. Now, the Forex quote works like this. For example, for each UK pound equals to 1.9150 to for each UK pound, which means stroke UK pounds, is worth at 1.9850. So if that's the case, then okay. Now, what we're going to be doing is that we need to understand that the second currency, which means the UK pound, stands for the base currency. Now, it's like looking at an apple, whether or not you're going to buy and sell an apple at how much. So we are looking at the base, which means the apple. Now, the dollar, which means the variable currency. 
And this is the starting point, so you can't mix up all together. The second thing that you need to do is that you need to see a couple of transactions and see which way you're still going to be using. So I would say that one, uh, 9150 compared to 9850, 9150 is lower. Now, this is the lower price. Technically, it's called the big price, but we don't really have to know that from the exams point of view. And this is called the higher price. And we are focusing from an entity's point of view, or we always lose. And this means that we always buy a high price and we always sell at low price. But remember, we are not talking about the variable currency, we are talking about the base currency. So remember, always remember that rule that we always lose. Now, let's see a couple of transactions and how we uh, combine this all together then. Now, the first transaction, suppose that we're going to be receiving $10,000. So suppose that $10,000 is the foreign currency. This is why the uh, forex risk comes into big. And what we need to do is to convert that into the UK pound. Okay, now, the step number one that we are going to be dealing with the transaction like this is that will be the base currency. As I said before, it's the base currency just to be the UK pound, okay? So just slot that there, it's the UK pound. That's the step number one there. Now, the step number two. Step number two, let's see the transaction. Because you are receiving dollars, but you are based in the UK. And dollars, yes, to a certain extent, it's useless. So what we need to do then, receiving that foreign currency, we need to sell that foreign currency. And that's it. Okay, if you look at the rule, okay, we sell at low price. So can we select 1.9150? Well, the answer is no, because we are always focusing on the base currency. So this means that we sell, we need to sell the dollar, which is the variable currency, but it's not a base currency. So we need to convert that into base currency. This means that to sell dollars, we can get pound, which means we can buy pound. Okay, so make sure they're ready for that. Now, we are buying pound, as I said before, we always buy at a high price. Okay, now, so that's why we need to select 1.9850 there. So, step three is that we buy at high price, which means 1.9850 stroke UK pound. So all we can do is do, yes, uh, firstly, the transaction about $10,000, secondly, $1.9850, dollars stroke UK pound. Now, as the final step, I would say that will be a step four there, is that if these two currencies are the same, so all you need to do is going to be using divide, so one divided through to another, and this why you can get the UK pound turn. That's the rule. And if that's not the same, uh, of course, you need to use multiply. So that equals to 5,038 UK pounds. Okay, so you can receive uh, 5038 equivalent to 10,000 USD. Okay, so that's the first transaction. Now, the second transaction is where you're going to pay $10,000 again is the uh, foreign currency. Now, as I said before, the step one will be the base currency, same as what we've seen, is the UK pound. And step two then, what you need to do then, in order to pay that foreign currency, pay dollar, you will need that dollar firstly. This means that you will need to buy dollar, but because base currency is in, in the UK pound, not in USD, so what you need to do to buy dollar, you need to exchange that with your UK pound, which means you're going to be selling the UK pound, okay? Just the opposite side, we need to buy the USD, which means we need to sell our currency or base currency. Of course, as a step three though, when we sell the UK pound, we need to sell at a low price. The low price is how much? 9150 okay?
the transaction volume, 10,000 again. So that's the step four there. Because the first currency is the same, we use divide. So in essence, we are paying 5222 UK pound. Moving on, the third transaction, let's say, that we're going to be receiving 10,000 UK pounds. So suppose that 10,000 UK pounds, the UK pounds now, is the foreign currency, let's say. So suppose that now we are based in the USA. Okay, now, step one, what would be the base currency? As I said before, look at the quote again. It's the base currency, same as what we've seen, is the UK pound. Okay, so UK pound is the second currency, which means the base currency, UK pound. So step two then, we receive that UK pound. Of course, what we need to do then is that we need to sell that UK pound because it's the foreign currency, because now we are based in the USA, and therefore, on the opposite side, we are buying the USD. Now, of course, it's already in the base currency, and this, this is why we sell always at a low price. Now, step three, we sell at a low price. The low price is, yes, 1.9150 and the transaction amount step 4 is 10,000 UK pound the first currency is not the same so we use multiply which means we cancel this out and this will give me the USD 19,150 so in essence we are receiving the foreign currency of 10,000 UK pound, equivalent to 19,150 USD. Final example, okay, just for fun, that we are paying effectively 10,000 UK pound. As a step one, then, the base currency is still the UK pound. Step two, it's to buy the UK pound, it's to pay the UK pound, so this means that we need to buy the UK pound. So do we need to convert that into USD? No, because UK pound is already the base currency. We can determine whether or not we use the low price or high price. So we need to buy the UK pound, always buy at a high price, and that's it. So step three, we select that high price being 1.91. 9A50 stroke UK pound and the step for the transaction volume amount 10,000 UK pound 1.9A50 and first currency is not the same we use multiply that equals to 19A50 so don't get this wrong okay I see very fundamental step in the AFM exam. Now, after we understood all of these bits and pieces, it, things get slightly easier when we look at the risk management. Now, when we talk about the Forex risk management, effectively, we are talking about three types of risks, namely the transaction risk related to a single transaction, which means receiving or paying money uh, in the form of foreign currency. Alternatively, translation risk. So in other words, that we've got a foreign subsidiary because we've invested our money overseas and therefore when we consolidate or bringing the subsidiary back to your group, the subsidiary is denominating the foreign currency. So we need to retranslate all those assets, liabilities, income expense in the group currency. And this is why it causes a bit of exchange rates differences between the foreign and the home currency and this is why we need to deal with that and finally we're going to be seeing the economic risk so which means the continuous unfavorable direction that the currency against your home currency so for example you are receiving the foreign currency however so the foreign currency continues to weaken against your home currency so 
if that's the case then, instead of receiving that foreign currency, why not just to expand your business in another country to receive another currency to uh, cancel the effect of weakening in income at some point in the future. That's very, very important. Though. Now, to deal with the uh, transaction risk, which means uh, just to be the risk that you're receiving or paying in foreign currency that may be deviating from the amounts that you expected before, we're going to be using either the internal or the external way to deal with the transaction risk. So effectively, internal way is whereby we're going to be invoicing in our own currency. External ways would be things like we are entering into the uh, financial instrument. Okay, so for example, the futures contract, forward contract, that kind of stuff. I'll tell you exactly how to do that later on. The way we're going to be managing the translation risk will be absolutely different there. So all we can do is to match the foreign currency asset with the foreign currency debt altogether. Because we are thinking about the translation risk. It's not about cash flows at all. So not about cash flows at all. Because if the foreign if the forex rate changes so for example resulting in more liabilities that we need to pay at the same time it will result in more assets that we have because of that exchange rate changes so assets minus liabilities is equals to equity so an increase in asset increase in liabilities equity stays the same decrease in asset decrease in liabilities that we owe to others Reduction in asset, reduction in liabilities, asset minus liabilities, equity still equals the same. So this is why we are matching the asset with debt, and that's how we manage the translation risk. So one of the ways that we can do is that if we operate in a foreign country, we also borrow in a foreign country, because we increase the debt denominated in foreign currency. At the same time, we've got our property plant equipment, such as the land and buildings denominated in foreign currency, we match them all together, and that's how we do it. Economic risk. Yes, we, we will be using two ways to manage the economic risk. Firstly, in terms of diversification. So in other words, why not? Don't put all of your eggs into one basket. So this means that why not to diversify your business using different supply chain? That's important. Just to diversify your business itself simply setting up your factory in one country, why not set up your factories in multiple countries? So instead of receiving income from only one country, why not to receive income from multiple countries? Okay, just to diversify your business, in other words. Alternatively, you're going to be diversifying your operations. So for example, uh, maybe in, in, in different product lines, and something like that. Supply chain, okay, receiving money from the foreign customer, paying money to the foreign supplier. Don't just rely on one single source of customer supplier. Why not to diversify your base? And this is what I mean by diversification. The second way is that most businesses uh, simply do will be to adjust their selling price, just to increase the selling price a bit further to compensate for the effect that we receive the income from a foreign country and the currency weakens against our home currency and this is why the income becomes less and less and why not just to increase our selling price to offset that effect that is how we do it. However, of course, in the exam you always tell the examiner increasing your selling price how about for volume? The volume will be affected, okay? Reduction in sales volume in particular. Now, from a syllabus point of view, we are going to be focusing primarily on the internal as well as the external ways to deal with the forex risk management. Now, firstly, let's talk about the internal ways that we can manage the transaction risk. So, internal ways to manage the transaction risk. So that's something to do with the cash flows. 
and this is why we need to be very, very careful now. Now, when I teach about the internal ways to manage the transaction risk, there are particularly four ways that we can always focus on. For example, we can invoice in our home currency. So instead of receiving that foreign currency, why not to receive our own home, home currency instead? And this means that this effectively cancels all these forex risks at all. The second ways that we can do is to use something called leading or lagging. Now, what do I mean by leading or lagging is that we are going to be receiving or paying something in advance or later, which means lagging. Uh, if we see that the... Uh, the income denominating foreign currency is very good so far. Why not to receive that money later? Because I would expect that I can receive more if I, if I was to receive it later. So leading or lacking will be one of the ways that you can manage your transaction risk. Another way, internal ways, will be to use matching. So matching simply implies two things here. Firstly, you're going to be match the foreign receipt with the foreign payment. And this is very common. So in other words, okay, I need to pay because I'm, for example, based in the UK, I need to pay the USD. At the same time, I will receive the income from the customer based in the USA. So why not just to use the income to offset against that payment? So we suffer from no or possibly very little forex risk as a result. The second ways that we can do is that we're going to be matching the foreign income with the foreign expenses. So in other words, for example, uh, we take debt or borrow some money from the foreign bank, we've incurred the foreign expense. We should pay this out. At the same time, we've got the foreign income. Use that foreign income to pay off that finance cost. So this is how we do it. The final ways that we're going to do, from the exams point of view, this is very, very topical, and make sure that you're ready for that. And the final way is called multilateral netting. Now, multinational netting is simply means that we're going to be net the payment and receipt within a group, within the same group. So net payment and receipt within the same group. So in other words, within a group, We've got multiple companies, we've got parent, many, many subsidiaries based in different countries. And many subsidiaries, yes, you may have studied the transfer pricing, buying and selling goods from each other to work together, okay, uh, to save costs for the entire business. It's absolutely fine that. So it owes some money to each of the subsidiary or each of the respective companies in turn. So instead of having all these transactions occurring at the same time, that we increase lots of uh, transaction costs and uh, suffering from the um, forex risk to a certain extent by the respective companies. Why not just to net all these payments and receipts into a few transactions and that's all we can do. Now, from the exams, in the AFM exams point of view, my approach would be to use my own mnemonic to deal with all sorts of issues related to it. It's called the CAN approach. Firstly, you will need to use the single currency, and that's very important. So usually it will be the USD in the actual exam. Secondly, you need to create a table and to net them off and make sure that you're ready for that. Now let's look at a simple example of how this can be done. So suppose that in the multinational netting case scenario is whereby we've got the receipts and payment okay, uh, from the, each of the companies in turn and 
incurring in the amount of transaction as well. And also we've got the quote, okay, is the forex quote that you need to convert that into the step number one as your currency. So let's say that in a group currency in a parent's company, let's say is denominated in the USD within the software step number one there. Now, what you need to do then is that we need to see the question. Now, let's say that we've got businesses based in Germany. Germany company is going to receive money from the US company for the amount of 6 million euro. And the forex quote is that for each euro, that equals to be 0.6919 USD. The second case is that the US company is going to receive money from a Germany company and in a form of $12 million. And because it's $12 million, so it's in dollars. Now, we don't really have to exchange that into another currency because we need to present all the currencies in the USD. The third case is that the Hong Kong company is going to receive money from a Germany company and for a total amount of 5 million Hong Kong dollars. And the forex quotes for that will be for each USD equals to 7.7821 Hong Kong dollars. And that's all we can do. Now, what we need to do then is to convert into that currency. How? Because firstly, the first uh, currency is not the same. Instead of using divide, I use multiply. And that being the case, it creates 4.151 million USD. Finally, the first currency is the same, so we use divide, so you can arrive at the USD being 0.643 million dollars there. Now, what we should do as the next step is to create a table. Now, step two is going to be creating a table, okay, which means C-A-N, okay, so that's what I mean by table there. All we can do is to list all this company on the right hand top at the same time on the left hand side. So for example, we've got the Germany company, the US company and the Hong Kong company. At the same time, we have got the Germany company, US company and the Hong Kong company on the left hand side. Now, what we need to do then is to say, okay, on the right hand side, we are always use payable, which means I need to pay some money to other companies. On the left hand side, I usually write out received. Received money or receivable from other companies. Of course, you can swap the way around, it's entirely up to you. Now, firstly, Germany company is not going to pay money to a Germany company at all because, as you can see, firstly, Germany company is going to receive from the US, okay, now, Germany company is, is going to receive from the US worth of 4.151 million dollars. Okay, now we deal with the first transaction. The second one is that US is going to receive from Germany 12 Tick, tick for that. Finally, Hong Kong is going to receive from Germany 0.643 million. Now, for all other areas, yes, it's blank. It's new, in other words. So, the final steps that we're going to do is to net them off. Okay. Now, we calculate what would be a total amount of payable firstly, is that 12 plus 0.643 becomes 12.643 million. 4.151 plus 0, 4.151 million. Now, what we need to do then is to bring this on the right hand side. Okay, so very, very 
important and, 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 and to see how much that we net them off. So for a total receipt from the uh, Germany company's point of view, Germany company is going to receive nothing and 4.151 plus nothing, that becomes 4.151 million and that becomes 12 million from a US company is going to receive and uh, Hong Kong company is going to receive 0.643 million. At the same time, we're going to be putting the payables okay, to respective companies in turn. So putting, for example, for the Germany companies, going to pay 12.643 million. And it's going to pay the US, going to pay 4.151 million. That's all. And there's nothing for a Hong Kong company. Okay, so we can calculate something called the net amount. Okay, we net them off, in other words. That's a step three there. So all we can do is to use the received minus payables and that becomes the net payment 8.492 million. Of course, in the exam, you use Excel spreadsheet and, and, and that becomes a lot easier. 12 minus 4.15 becomes 7.849 million. And this minus that becomes 0.643 million. Now, finally, we need to tell the examiner what's going on in there. Okay, what's going on? Relatively straightforward indeed. Firstly, for the Germany company, it's going to pay, it's going to pay 8.492 million. It's going to pay 8.492 million. At the same time, the US company is going to receive 7.849 million. At the same time, Hong Kong company is going to receive 0.643 million from the Germany company. So in essence, the Germany company pays 8.492 to the US and to the Hong Kong company respectively. And the US and Hong Kong company will be receiving that uh, 7.849 and 0.643 million from the Germany company. And this is how we do it. So uh, make sure that we are always happy okay with uh, with the internal ways four ways that we need to bear that in mind right i'm going to be stopping the recording now for the internal part in the next of our recording i will focus primarily on the external part okay using my own technique and uh, to be applied to the AFM exam in easy steps i look forward to seeing you then bye bye APC.